So I'm very happy to present the Web Audio Module 2.0 uh, Web Audio Plugin Standard that we are proposing. Uh, it, it's a community effort from people from diff different uh, universities, from freelance developers, some people from private companies that were also interested. And uh, just to uh, give you some history, uh, since the beginning of 2020, we met every Monday at 5 p.m. for one hour uh, every week. And uh, each of us has contributed uh, uh, to, uh, to the work that we present. And some other people just came in, came out, or, or followed what we were doing. But uh, this is the, the, the group that really contributed. So uh, you've got all the logos of the different uh, uh, universities, laboratories, and uh, that contributed. So it's uh, an open source uh, project and it's not sponsored by any comp private companies. And uh, even if we, uh, you'll see that we, we've got uh, three different licenses on the SDK, we've got to clear some of the things out, but it will be an open source project. So some history, before 2015, uh, Web Audio, it was the, the date of the first Web Audio conference where we saw uh, impressive demos like a Web Audio Vocoder by Chris Wilson and we saw some uh, Rhythm uh, drum box. Uh, we could see also Loop Drop that was a, a DG application and so on. And uh, recreation of the Minimoog, uh, things like that. And um, uh, it was, uh, uh, very well um, promising uh, but at, at this time we had no dual worklets no web assembly uh, no standard for exchanging plugins like the uh, the, the computer music uh, domain is doing with uh, uh, hosts and plugins and so on so we could find very impressive uh, JavaScript libraries like TonJS that is still very popular. Uh, some some open source repositories. I'm thinking about Chris Wilson's one because it was a uh, uh, one of the best uh, early resource uh, for learning uh, web audio. And um, we had some uh, online tools for music synthesis like Genish, some uh, live coding uh, languages, uh, and so on. And even some DSL for DSP programming that could compile to uh, MScript 10 uh, in the time, like Faust, that is used by many developers as it can compile, uh, this language can compile to C++ to, uh, and generate VSTs, uh, Juice plugins, and so on. So we could find some effects and instruments, and some of them were really impressive. And um, they came with the first proposal for a Web Audio uh, plugin standard called Web Audio Modules. Uh, in 2015, uh, I saw the presentation by Jarek Clemola, but he was working with uh, Oliver Keen, and they proposed the uh, recreations of uh, uh, very well-known commercial synthesizers like uh, the DX, uh, DX7 by Yamaha, or the OBXD by Oberheim, uh, and so on. And uh, they were compiled to uh, MScript 10 at this time, and they relied on the web components for the packaging, but the web component uh, standard that is made of four different APIs from the W3C was also uh, still in draft uh, version, so not stable. And uh, well, they were pioneering uh, how we could uh, make an interoperable, interchangeable uh, uh, plugins. So they mainly designed uh, the Web Audio Module standard for people who wanted to port existing uh, C, C++ VSTs. So for example, the OBXD and the, the DX7 were uh, open source projects written in C++. Uh, that's uh, this team, uh, Jerry and Oliver, uh, managed to cross compile and uh, to port to, uh, to the web. So they had to redo the GUI, but um, uh, it was a very impressive work and started to uh, to uh, go from the toy project to a really uh, kind of professional project. Uh, with this standard in 2015, a plugin was a one single audio worklet node running MScript. Uh, so uh, I was inspired with uh, people from my team and uh, with other researchers. Uh, 
une particulière de people who made the first uh, programming language. So in 2018, uh, we also were working with uh, the creators of the web audio modules, Jerry Clemola and Oliver Larkin. We proposed the WAP the web audio plugin standard that was an extension uh, and uh, as you will see the the web audio modules from 2015 were uh, a sort of subset of what we could propose and uh, the idea was to uh, have the plugins really uh, web aware like each plugin has a unique uri that you can use to download it in a host to uh, load it in a host uh, so we created uh, this standard that could support uh, more uh, approaches like for JavaScript developers who wanted to build a, a web audio graph using a high level uh, web audio API uh, nodes, for example, or people who wanted to use a DSL like Fast or uh, pure data uh, patches, uh, cross compiled and so on. So uh, we went further by proposing also uh, a sort of guidelines for setting up uh, plugin uh, servers remote plugin servers. So for example, in this demo of the WAPs in that time, you could enter the uh, URI of a repository and you click explore repository and you've got thumbnails of the plugins that are coming. And if you click on a plugin, you can uh, enjoy the plugin. So I am not hearing any sound. I don't know why. And if you change the name of the, uh, sorry, if you change the uh, name of the repository, uh, I, I haven't done what, okay, I need to copy and paste, I thought, yes. And then you could explore another plugin repository and uh, instantiate the plugins and so on. So this is uh, what we, we had in uh, 2018. So we tried to uh, to make WAMS a bit more web friendly than what existed uh, and we were compatible with the existing uh, WAMS. So the ecosystem we imagined was uh, this one where, where we had WAPs uh, as a sort of uh, unification. And then you could have uh, plugins developed in JavaScript, in WebAssembly and audio worklets. And uh, they could have been written in first or as web audio modules compiled from C++ and so on. So that was the idea. Uh, but it was uh, in that time, the web components were not mature. We uh, didn't uh, propose the SDK that uh, used uh, uh, JavaScript modules like imports, dynamic imports, and so on. WebAssembly was just very, very young. And uh, we um, didn't, uh, we choose not to uh, add in the SDK things like automation, like uh, trying to have high performance events so that you do not leave the audio thread. So we, we had a sort of simplified uh, plugin specification if you compare this with what existed in the native world. So the last year, so this year, sorry, this year, with uh, a bunch of, uh, of people that I presented earlier, uh, an extended group of, uh, of the one 2018, we uh, decided to um, create <laughs> well, an evolution of the preview standard. But this time we, we went back to the web audio module name first because WAP is a bad name. So WAP was a, a mobile phone protocol. And uh, also uh, most of the people from the web audio community thought that WAP and WAMS were two different things. And also some people in the industry, in the computer music industry, knew only the WAMs. So uh, web, audio web Audio Module was a well-known and recognized uh, standard name and not WAP. So we came back to the original name. And this time we uh, decided to redo everything from scratch, taking into account all the modern uh, advances we had uh, uh, with JavaScript, with the building system. People want to use uh, TypeScript or want to use React or want to develop uh, using uh, uh, other languages uh, like Fast, C++, uh, etc. And we wanted to have automation, focus on performance. For example, uh, Owen will uh, present how we use a ring buffer for uh, discussing for uh, using the parameters uh, without quitting the audio thread and uh, but we wanted also to support plain GS 
or Bull Systems, C++, DSL, and so on. Uh, parameter automation was also a, a, a big stuff uh, that took us a, a few months before uh, agreeing that the web audio parameters were a bad thing. <laughs> so <laughs> more about this uh, later on. And uh, even the web audio working group from the Bayer 3 c agreed. So uh, this might be something that uh, will surprise you. Uh, and also, uh, when we specified host plugin and direction, so we uh, we provide the SDK for people who want to reuse existing code. We we facilitate things like loading a plugin, like uh, defining the parameters and so on. But some uh, low-level developers they want just an API and they want to re-implement everything themselves. So uh, existing experienced uh, native uh, audio plugin developers they don't want your filter. They want their ones. They don't want to deal with your way of uh, interpolating the parameters. They want their own code and so on. So we decided to uh, split the, um, the proposal into an API, I mean, a sort of uh, abstract classes, and uh, a SDK that uh, is also partially implementing the API and providing uh, extra tools. So uh, this, this was the idea. So I can show you some, uh, some examples. So we've got, um, this is the host that uh, is provided with the SDK. And uh, all the examples are also provided with the SDK. So just to show you, for example, if I click on a plugin that is provided, this is the URL, URI. So in that case, it's a relative one, but you can enter also absolute one if you click load plugin. This loads the plugin in the page and you can try it. <laughs> And you can also, if the plugin uh, follow the guidelines, uh, it exposes uh, different parameters. So you can uh, do automation uh, on them. Sorry. Uh, okay, let me try to do something better. So this is for just for uh, testing it. So if I am uh, adding some uh, automation uh, on two of the parameters and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this rapidly, so I hope it's gonna... So if I try this, you can see the knobs that are moving in real time, interpolated, and uh, it works. Also. Okay, so this is for pure JavaScript uh, plugins. We've got some JavaScript that have been built, you know, using uh, Parcel or using some building uh, frameworks. Uh, you can find also instruments. So we provided some plugins like a MIDI keyboard or an extended MIDI keyboard that can send program changes and uh, some uh, different events. And we uh, also provided some instruments like this one. The tiny synth is the headless plugin without any uh, GUI. But you can see that here we chain the keyboard plugin that is not producing any sound with the, uh, the pure uh, JavaScript general MIDI synthesizer. So we are also providing um, uh, plugins compiled with FOST. For example, this is a, a phaser effect that uh, you can build in less than one minute uh, using the FOST uh, tools that I will show later. So here you've got, we, I just loaded the... So you see, uh, they, they have been loaded without any conflicts between the JavaScript, the, the CSS, uh, and uh, the HTML. And uh, this one is, is compiled in WebAssembly also, so don't have to worry. Uh, so we've got example uh, written in, uh, in TypeScript. So Xiong has done some uh, visualizations here, the visualization plugins. So for example, uh, this one is the oscilloscope. That uh, this one uh, you've got spectrogram and so on. So, uh, well, you, you get the idea. We've got uh, one plugin written in C sound as uh, Stephen uh, E uh, contributed also to the SDK. It was part of our group. Um, so this one takes a little bit longer to load. So it's uh, a pitch shifter written in C sound. Thank <laughs> you. 
And uh, all of these plugins work also on Firefox. Uh, I think the screenshots on the on the slides are from Firefox, except the MIDI plugins, as Firefox doesn't have yet the um, the support for uh, for Web MIDI. And here I am loading a, a node uh, WAM that existed in version WAM. Uh, from 2015 that we ported to the WAM2 standard, so it's OBXD. So you can, uh, okay. So uh, this is a wall Oberheim uh, plugin that was written in C++, cross-compiled to WebAssembly and so on. So this was just for showing, uh, giving, giving you uh, 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 some some taste and also sorry the last demo is a pedal board plugin and this shows that uh, we can have a plugin that is loading plugin so we've got a plugin that is uh, acting as a host here so i can instantiate different plugins uh, in the chain so i can uh, have presets and uh, And I can drag and drop, change the order, and so on. So this is uses only a, a JSON file for with the URI of the plugins, and the plugins have a descriptor with categories, so you can filter them. So and this is written using React for uh, for information. So we've got really different approaches for writing the plugins here, uh, and. Um, so uh, I wanted also to warn the people what are watching this uh, workshop that for the workshop, we will use a work in progress a GitHub repo. But the, um, as Web Audio module is an old standard, it has uh, uh, a home site called webaudiomodules.org and it has an official repo, GitHub repo that is uh, there. And we will add uh, a branch there so that people will be able to uh, find out the old version for legacy, but also a new branch for the updated version. So it's still a work in progress, and um, uh, but it should be uh, pushed there uh, really soon uh, as we really uh, try to package everything for the workshop today. And everything is under, uh, well, not one, but multiple open source licenses because we are embedding uh, examples and uh, libraries and uh, uh, source code examples from uh, other. So last demo is a, a WAM in different hosts and in particular in a digital audio workstation. So this is a tube guitar amplifier um, that uh, I've wrote during the, the past year. So here it's running on my machine on a, from a local uh, directory. So so this is a Marshall GCM 800 recreation and the host file is just a simple uh, HTML page with a, a very short uh, JavaScript code for loading the plugin and the loading of the plugin is done here, await, import, something. So. Uh, what I showed here was uh, the simplest host, sorry, not here, but the simplest host you could imagine, this one. But the same plugin, I mean, exactly the same plugin can also be loaded in the host provided uh, by uh, the SDK. So this is what is happening here. So and it exposes the different parameters and so on. And uh, it can also be loaded in a real commercial DAO that is uh, ampedstudio.com and uh, they provided us with uh, a developer uh, URL so we can try uh, our, um, our uh, plugins so the and the plugin is the same from the same URI uh, that has been loaded so I can uh, for example uh, drag and drop my file we will find something to guitar tracks back in black something. Yes, I can, I think, drag and drop uh, a wave file. Should be okay, no? Yes, okay. And if I play it, okay, no, it does okay, okay. Okay, sorry, I got this thing. Maybe I made something wrong. Uh, I should put a file that I master. Okay, so if I drag and drop a file uh, from uh, my my hard disk, uh, I should have prepared this. I'm sorry. Where is uh, 
I think I've got some. Uh, well, okay. So uh, you will have to trust me. <laughs> I don't have. Uh, where do I have um, some dry files somewhere? You could try grabbing one of those uh, Green Day ah. ones from the repo. Yeah, from from the repo. So a guitar one from here, for example. Which Funk one? or git? Yeah, uh, this one maybe. Uh, I've got maybe also to, sh to close some of the other uh, demos. Yeah, I've got too many things running also. Yeah, okay, let's try. Yeah. So you've got the ID and um, uh, in the um, in the, the online version of Ampet Studio, uh, we have uh, uh, already uh, provided multiple plugins from the, uh, the standard from 2018, and we are porting, currently porting them uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the, the online DAW uh, there. So uh, this was just to, uh, to show you that uh, uh, what we've got is a standard that can be already today be loaded in multiple hosts. And Tom, a developer that joined our group uh, recently, will prov present very impressive demo uh, as he has written his own host. And uh, he's, he's also, uh, he also brought a, a set of very impressive uh, WAM2 plugins. So now um, I think Owen will talk about the WAM2 architecture and rationale behind it. So I stop uh, sharing my screen and Owen, I give you the control. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Owen. I'll try to make this go smoother. So, <clears throat> just sharing the screen. All right, uh, everyone see this? Okay, cool. So um, <clears throat> yeah, as Michelle mentioned, we had a lot of discussion over the last year or so, um, trying to make sure that uh, all these different approaches to designing plugins would be supported. And um, one of the, the trickiest things to decide on was uh, parameter automation. Um, but also, uh, well, yeah, just to recap, we, we, tried to, we tried really hard to separate the API from the SDK so that as a developer, um, if you don't like any of the code in the SDK, you don't have to use it at all. Uh, as long as you implement the right methods on your class. And uh, I guess one, one other requirement to fully implement this is that um, your plugin basically has to have at least one audio workload node involved to give access to the audio thread. Um, but yeah, in the SDK, we've got reference implementations and some utilities you can use if uh, that helps you get up and running quicker. Um, so this is the overall uh, structure of the system here. So you can have hosts that schedule from the main thread or the audio thread. And as long as the plugin is fully implementing the API, that'll be kind of transparent. Um, The, uh, the WAM env is something that kind of runs in the background that plugins should interact with, or at least would need to be re-implemented to work properly. But that's the way that we have handles to the plugins, uh, the processors on the audio thread. Um, other than that, it's, it's more or less what you would expect. There's on the main thread, you have 
the GUI and um, sort of all the asynchronous stuff like loading the plugin and on the audio thread, we're keeping it just to the processing and um, we do have methods for interacting with the host just for uh, event scheduling so that an audio, uh, host written to basically run entirely in the audio thread doesn't have to go back to the main thread, back to the audio thread to do uh, scheduling. Um, so things to keep in mind, um, you know, assuming you care about uh, accurate timing, um, the design is such that uh, if you're scheduling from the main thread, you have this uh, thread barrier to deal with. So you have to have look ahead in your sequencing, for example, to make sure that the events arrive to the processor um, before the actual uh, time that they should be processed. So all this stuff is based on the audio context plot. Um, so in an audio thread host, because there's no uh, jumping threads, you can schedule just in time, like right at the beginning of the, um, the render cycle. And so it would just be important to make sure that your sequencer is getting pulled by the web audio graph before you know, all the plugins. Um, so again, uh, we didn't want to uh, over-prescribe anything. And I, I hope that people find that we haven't um, and that the, it's as flexible as people need in terms of how you can implement this stuff. And one thing that was really um, awkward was the web audio, audio param interface because um, it, uh, it provides only a very, only very specific methods for changing parameters and, and scheduling those changes. And it's all from the main thread. Um, in addition to that, it's, it's like if you're porting like a VST and you have hundreds of uh, plugin parameters, you don't necessarily want to expose all of those as these uh, official audio params. So even for plugins that uh, do make use of native web audio nodes, um, we are kind of preventing um, hosts from interacting with those API calls directly. And uh, if you're thinking, well, how, how do I actually interact with those? Well, uh, Xion can show you um, a one very nice way that he came up with to, to deal with that called the Param Manager. Um, so, Xihang, uh, let me know if you want to jump in or if anyone has any questions to uh, try to check the chat here, too. Yeah, um, I can do the rest. Uh, cool. Parts. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Thank you. I will stop sharing. So it's touch sharing my screen. Okay. That's my screen, I think. Yeah, we see we see the screen. Yeah, okay. So yes. uh, yeah, from now as we are in this workshop, um, the yeah, I will try to like have everyone um, clone already the repo and get in touch to our code and the uh, actual uh, examples so um yeah the first thing we we need to do is just to uh, clone the repository um i think i have already shared the the link in the in the chat so uh yeah i'll take some time to my computer uh clone this repo um yes and Maybe I'll just uh, put it on a, a little uh, a folder. Let's 
So yeah, um, as Owen just said, we uh, in the repo we have a separate package. So this repo is actually um, a model repo full of uh, examples and uh, a special one called SDK. So in the packages, you can see many of examples and uh, two hosts. And there's a the one there's one called SDK. I will just drop um, this thing in my ID. Show the code. So I use uh, VS Code to develop all things, but you can also uh, use your favorite one. A little bit. So I would just to get into this SDK to like show you. Um, there's actually uh, in source file uh, in source folder. There's one folder called API. This is the essential of um, all the WAM two standards. So uh, uh, in previous slide we showed that uh, we have separated the API and the SDK and the, S, uh, the API is actually uh, all the descriptions of this standard and all of them are described in this TypeScript definition file. So uh, yeah, you have uh, the first thing, the web audio module uh, class interface. Uh, which is the entry point of every um, every WAM uh, module, and there's three essential things in, in this interface, which is the descriptor. Uh, you can see it as a uh, metadata for um, the information of vendor, the name, um, just the version of it, and uh, some screenshot for for its thumbnail things like that. And you will have um, the audio node property, uh, which should extend uh, or implement this web node API. So this is the uh, the main part of DSP you will include in, in your uh, web audio module. And of course, you have uh, the access to the actual uh, audio context. And you will be able to extend uh, to override this um, method to create your own uh, audio node and cre create your GUI element. So the GUI is uh, or a web component or just uh, a normal HTML element. So uh, we will try to we'll try to show uh, everyone as there's uh, several examples and templates we prepared in these packages and um, we'll try to explain some of these uh, simple ones and uh, try to modify or customize uh, some of these. So and, uh, all, yeah. all, the, all the demos I showed uh, are in the repo. Yeah. So, in the, in the repo, we actually we haven't uh, installed anything, but there's uh, already a host that can load uh, every one of every of these uh, examples. So uh, let's get um, to see maybe one of them, uh, a random one. So uh, actually, it already provides uh, these two things. Uh, the first one is uh, descriptor.json. So that's a JSON file for the host. Um, so if a host wants to like load a, a plugin, it need to know before uh, before the import of the actual uh, JavaScript code uh, that um, there's some basic informations of, about uh, the actual plugin. So the name and vendor information, or if if um, the uh, the plugin has some um, MIDI input or MIDI output or some additional uh, event processors it can can handle. Um, then it's just the the index of JS, uh, which will provide as an ES module. 
and it will export as default um, the a class constructor, which will extend the web, uh, web audio module. And yeah, you can find every uh, part of the API and this description in this API, um, SDK API uh, folder uh, with this types.d.ts. And uh, yeah, maybe it's better to like show an actual plugin. So um, our first there is also example. there is also documentation uh, online uh, available uh, from the host page uh, of the SDK. You've got HTML generated uh, documentation of all these methods. Yeah, uh, I will show you how to access access them later. Um, so we will get to. Uh, the installation part. So uh, we are all a uh, web developer. Maybe you already have um, first two requirements, uh, Git or uh, Node.js. Uh, we are using Yarn because this is a monorepo, so uh, Yarn can handle uh, all these sub, uh, sub packages in, in one uh, large bucket package. So I will just open a terminal and uh, to install yarn globally you just need to use npm which is larger enough npm uh, dash g iphone install and yarn so this will uh, allow you to like install a uh, actual version of yarn so the latest is 1.22 i think if there's a newer one just about to, to release um, yarn 2 we are testing under yarn 1. yeah then you can clone the repository i just cloned it and uh yeah so to like if you already cloned the the, the repo, you need to build some of these um, packages because some of, some of them, them are written in TypeScript or some building system. So you can just do yarn build. Um, yarn install first, do an install yeah, first. Before it's, yeah, before it's, it's, you need to do yarn to install every dependencies, then yeah. yarn build. So, so ju just to uh, to tell you, you don't have to uh, to use Yarn or whatever to write a plugin. But if you want to run all the examples from the repo, and uh, like I showed in my demo, then you need to install this to to build some of the uh, some of the plugins that are in TypeScript or React or whatever. But uh, you can write. Um, plugins in plain JavaScript uh, without building any building system, or if you are prefer, you can install your own uh, packages and, uh, and make a React project or whatever. Yeah, so uh, for the, the examples I will show, uh, uh, you uh, actually you, you've, got a you've, you've got a question in the, the discussion. Yeah, oh, Yarn sorry. is yet another package manager. <laughs> it's uh, like NPM, but uh, with a few functionalities in addition. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, Yarn is actually um, uh, extended NPM for like uh, in some cases, like this one, you have many packages in, in one repo. Yarn is uh, quite useful for that. And uh, yeah, for the uh, examples I will show today, you actually don't need a build system to like write any um, web examples, but for like you to run the host um here or to run a local host to, to like uh, serve these um these hosts and the plugins you may need yarn and also i recommend to uh, use a, a vs code plugin called live server uh, that allows you to quickly run a local host um against any yeah uh from any uh, HTML file from this repo. So if you already installed the uh, live server, you will have this go live 
and um, yeah, it will automatically uh, run a, a, a local server in that. So I just uh, um, did my installation uh, of all the dependencies. So now I can, I think, run Yarn build. So in Yarn build, it, it will uh, at first place build the SDK and the, the corresponding uh, files for ES modules. Um, so it will be a packed one, a packed ES module of the whole SDK. And again, uh, the SDK are just uh, some tools and uh, uh, reference uh, implementations of the API. So actually, if you want to write uh, um, web audio module from from zero you can also do that uh, it, it's just you need to conform all the apis for the host so um, the host can get uh, every information from that um, yeah so i did the build and now i can do yarn start to run a host Um, the host is under this package host and it will serve at localhost uh, with the port 1234. I will just get this address in my Chrome. Yeah, so now it's working. Um, I can show maybe a, a tiny thing with a simple MIDI keyboard. Can I hear the sound? You hear the sound? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we got the sound. Yeah, so um, yeah. this is the, the host uh, that need to uh, run yarn start to launch. Uh, I will just stop that. And if you have this um, live server, you can also have this uh, other another version of the, the host that don't need any uh, build system. So uh, let me just do that. So this is uh, another, actually a uh, same host, but uh, without any building system. So the host doesn't have to be built. We have a version without a uh, need to be built, but we we built the, the first version uh, as we have, we built the other plugins that uh, really need to be built. So yeah. <laughs> if not, it's clear, but when we built the plugins uh, the first time, we built the original version of our host that we rewrote uh, just for the WAC without a building system because it was not required. So the host okay. is just uh, HTML and JS. Yeah. So uh, I hope everyone get this repo um, installed correctly. If you have any question, uh, yeah, don't hesitate to, to ask in the chat. So I will continue to uh, open um, in a template, an example, uh, which have uh, very very simple implementation and uh, yeah um, the the main object of this um, this demo this uh, example is that if you have any of your DSP written in audio worklet or a web audio node you can easily port them in uh, into like wrapped uh, into a web audio module without uh, any uh, modifications on your on your code. Um, yeah, so you can open, you can duplicate this um, package called uh, underscore PMGS. So this is our template. I will just duplicate this one. And in our case, I will uh, rename it as uh, simple feedback. here. So in this um, template, you have uh, a really simple host for you to test. And in source, uh, you have the descriptor um, and index.js. 
uh, we will just start take a look at this descriptor.json. Um, as I mentioned, it's just some basic information of the current uh, module. So um, we just need to maybe rename it. Simple feedback. And you can fill your name or your version yeah, as you wish. Then in the index, is, here is where, where um, the actual things happen when it's loaded into the a host. So we are import uh, a reference um, implementation from the SDK, um, the web audio module to extend it. So that you would don't need to like customize uh, every um, method or override them, they are all um, written. And uh, here in the node.js node node file, you will have a web node uh, of which we need to like load from uh, this uh, create out new audio node method. So this is, this is also the task of this uh, web audio module class because you need to uh, initialize every uh, every web node and also the GUI. Uh, so the user interface is under this GUI.js. So it's also imported. Uh, one tricky things you need to take here quick, is quick question. Yeah. Is it possible yeah. to create headless uh, without GUI uh, plugins? Yeah, you can totally do that. Okay. Without GUI, it will work uh, yeah. like normal. Okay. Not your part. Yeah, uh, yeah. The tiny synth uh, we showed, you know, with the MIDI keyboard, didn't have any GUI, so uh, we just connected a plugin that was emitting not to a headless plugin that was generating sounds. And uh, he, here in the folder, you can see Node.js is for the DSP part and UI is for the user interface. And it's the index.js that is just joining them together. So if in, in index.js, you do not reference any UI, like the line six import create element from blah, blah, blah. Uh, so you, you can create a, a plugin without the UI. So um, uh, the, this file is uh, acting like an ES module when it uh, gets uh, imported into a host. So uh, there's one tricky part uh, to take here is the relative path of um, all these uh, modules or um, some like resources like PNG or JSON. So when you need to like fetch um, any external file from your uh, constructor, you need to use this import.meta.url to actually get the uh, actual URI of this uh, ES module, but not the hosts. So here we use uh, this import.meta.url to like store a base URL of this actual uh, ES module index.js here. So that uh, you can, when you get the descriptor.json, it will refer to uh, this file, but not the host. And uh, in this uh, file, the first thing we do is to load the descriptor JSON to the um, descriptor field uh, of this web audio module. So we just do a fetch um, of this file descriptor.json and merge it into uh, the current descriptor. So this allows the a host to get um, also uh, the same descriptor uh, from either from the JSON or from uh, the instance of this web audio module. Then in uh, this method called create audio node, we will prepare our um, Running audio mode, uh, running audio nodes to like um, for the host to like be able to connect this node with other audio nodes uh, in the host. So here, what we do is we set up, we create a new audio node, and we do a setup. 
then we just return the, the node for the host. So now the host can uh, get this working node uh, and connect with other audio nodes. And in this create GUI, we just uh, return uh, an HTML element here for the host to attach to, to a storm tree. And we also have this destroy GUI in case the host want to dispose any uh, GUI from this created from this web audio module, it can also uh, destroy it with uh, uh, another clean up callback if you want to have. So yeah, so in this file, actually you don't need to uh, change anything because you're uh, supposed to have a DSP part just in, in this node. And I will quickly show you how this node works because it's a, a special node with um, many of node inside. It's called a composite node, composite audio node. Uh, I have a slide for this, I think. Uh, let me just move uh, into this slide. So composite audio node is also uh, a useful tool provided by the, by the SDK. And uh, it will allow you it allows you to um, have your node uh, wrapped into this um, this composite audio node, which actually implements a web node API. And uh, if you already have your node written, your audio node written uh, for other usage, you can just uh, connect the node uh, from uh, the composite audio nodes input and define an output um, in this composite audio node. And then when uh, the host want to connect uh, this composite audio node from source on uh, this uh, destination, it will just uh, use the output to connect to other, uh, other node. And when it do a source.connect uh, composite audio node, it will just refer to a uh, gain node uh, where it's extending from. Well, and, in other yeah. words, this is what makes a plugin uh, being usable like any web audio node with connect, disconnect, and so on. Yeah. So uh, the other part of this composite audio node is that actually it will implement a web node API. Um, and a web, web node API actually have some other usages for the host, as um, you can see here in, in where I open an SDK. Um, so a web node uh, allows you to get uh, parameter info, get parameter values, uh, get a state and set a state. Um, and you can also schedule events, like do some uh, parameters or make automations here. So every um, automation part or MIDI events are all called WAM event here, and you can schedule um, all these events with a, a precise time. Um, so the WAM node will like emit them on the right time you defined um, in future, and. All these events can be emitted when, if you do this uh, connect event from uh, this node to um, uh, to other <clears throat> downstream uh, downstream web node. So the uh, the event will flow from uh, this node to others. So, um, but again, if you use um, if you use the SDK, like the two of the uh, implementation of one node, uh, you will not uh, need to implement all these because they are implemented. Uh, and what I would introduce is this Prime Manager node, and it will also implement the web node API, and it will have other uh, methods allows you to handle the parameters of your uh, audio parameter, audio params. So, um, because I imagine if you already have uh, written some DSP in, in web audio, you will uh, expose these parameters as audio params. 
And we already say that we will not uh, provide audio prime to a uh, web host because uh, it, will, it has some drawbacks and uh, some complex method to uh, resolve and it's not controllable from um, audio workload thread. So we will need, we will have this param manager node to um, handle all these audio params you already have. Um, we all know that um, any audio node can be connected on um, uh, to any audio param to control it. So uh, actually, a param manager node um, have uh, has many outputs audio output that is connected to um, to audio param or it can also do some uh, callbacks. If you have non-audio param, uh, parameters, you can attach a unchanged callback for the param manager to um, when, when, the, when the parameter's value changed, it can call this unchanged uh, callback. Okay. May, may I say something, uh, Xiong? Yeah. Well, I try to uh, summarize a little bit this. If you have a plugin that, for example, has three knobs, maybe each knob is linked to multiple internal web audio parameters. So in that case, a knob mix, for example, that will use two gains uh, uh, under the hood, two web audio gains under the hood, when you want to automate this uh, this parameter, or when you, when you want to describe this parameter, this mix param, mix is not a web audio param. It doesn't exist in the web audio API, uh, etc. So what the param manager is providing and what we provided uh, in this uh, standard is a way to declare that the mix param, if you want to, when you turn it, when you automate it, it will in turn use the internals of uh, the web audio api to uh, to interpolate the two different gains that will do the dry wet uh, stuff so it's quite a complex part of the sdk uh, as we had to deal with okay my knob is linked to a real audio param my knob is linked to multiple audio param my knob must be uh, automated uh, using my own method and so on so this is uh, what the param manager will do so it's an abstraction over different kind of params that could be complex or simple that could be linked to many internal uh, params uh, or not and so on so maybe Xiong, uh, i don't know if you will manage to explain this uh, simply but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's quite quite complicated but uh, okay here you de you de you describe the different types of uh, params mm. yeah, yeah, I'll param, just, uh, param. yeah i'll just maybe show, 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 example. show an example yeah yeah, so uh, here is a simple feedback uh, node uh, that is composed by a delay node, uh, two gains. So um, uh, this is quite a, a easy way to have a simple delay and with a with a feedback. So in the in this composite audio node, uh, we will firstly create this node and assign to a. a a field of this uh, this class. So you have, uh, you have created two gain uh, delay, and uh, finally you will be able to connect them together. But we will just start it from create these nodes. Uh, then we know that uh, this feedback node, which is a gain node, have one audio param called gain, and uh, the delay node have uh, an audio param called delay time. So we stored these two audio param here, which called gain and delay to constant. Then in this uh, param manager factory, we define that we have two internal parameters, one called gain, one called delay. They are all uh, audio params. Then uh, we have this external parameters they can, they are actually interfaces from uh, a WAM node. They are not audio param, but they can be schedulable. Uh, so they are also called a gain and a delay with some uh, 
customization uh, as we, we can have a default value, we have uh, other max value or min value, we can have a label. So these two, uh, these two configs delay and gain, the external one actually exposed for the host. So the host is actually controlling this gain and this delay. And inside the prime manager, it will handle automatically uh, the link from the, uh, the WAM parameter to your audio param just by declare uh, such a thing, such a, a, a config. So yeah, so um, we create here uh, a brand manager node, which is um, here also a proxy for us to, to be able to use all, all the, uh, the WAM node API. So we assign it to underscore WAM node. So, um, so the, this, co uh, this composite audio node will be able to, um, to handle any uh, WAM, WAM node API methods. And in the setup section, oh, we already create all these nodes, so uh, we connect them together. And finally, we assign uh, the output as um, our gain node. Uh, as our output. So um, yeah, this is the, the node part. I hope it's uh, clear enough. Um, and next thing we need to uh, have a look on to this GUI element. So this is actually a web component. Um, so to describe a web component, we just need to extend an HTML element uh, a class and uh, from the the constructor we define that we have an audio node um, which we can uh, define from from uh, when we create the when we create the um, yeah here when we create the element we can define this audio node and the node is just what we described in, in node.js, so this one. And um, we will attach our HTML element uh, into this shadow root. Then we have, now we have two uh, input. So there are two sliders. Uh, we will need to attach some um, callbacks when we change these sliders, what will happen. So uh, here, so gain input, when, when we uh, drag this slider, it will set a parameter value, the gain, with an ID and a value. And if it's normalized, so it's false. And we have also this uh, delay input, uh, uh, a change callback, which you have to say. Then, um, we need to update all these sliders uh, because if we, we do the automation, um, these sliders actually it should uh, move itself. So uh, we attach a request animation frame, a callback uh, called handle animation frame. So uh, each frame we get um, the parameter values from the audio node. Um, it will return us the actual value of each uh, parameter, and we just put the value into the slider, so it will update automatically. And when the uh, when the HTML element is destroyed or disconnected, we just cancel this uh, callback for from request animation frame. So that's it. Um, so this is the part of the GUI, and we so can connected run, co yeah. connected callback and so on are coming from the web components API, the custom element API and so on. Yeah, we can just take a look uh, into this host. What happened uh, when we need to load this uh, this web WAM? So in the host, we have actually an audio player. Uh, who is playing this MP3. And we have a div called mount where we 
we'll need to uh, attach our GUI here. So in the JavaScript part, um, we get <laughs> this element from, uh, from its ID. Uh, we get our media, event, uh, media element audio source node from this player. And when the, when the page gets loaded, it will import. So this is an ES module uh, dynamic import from this uh, index.js. So the default default output is this uh, web audio module uh, constructor. So you will be able to call uh, this static method called create instance. So this is loading the plugin. This is uh, the, the loading of the plugin, line 43, uh, 42. And uh, what is in the import between parentheses is a URI. So it could be relative or absolute, like HTTPS, something, something. And then yeah. you instantiate line 46. Yeah. Uh, two so lines. Yeah, we, we will need, we, we will have this uh, instance of web module module. And we will just connect it from our um, audio player to uh, the audio context destination to play that. So it will just be in the middle of the player and the destination. And then we mount, uh, we use this create GUI to create um, yeah, the GUI element, the DOM node. So uh, it will, when we call the uh, mount plugin, it will attach this, this DOM node uh, to the mount div. Yeah, so uh, let's play, let's just uh, launch this host the test. So we will have our two sliders and the player. So the first one is the feedback level. The second, I think is the delay time. So everything should work. Okay, this is the first example. And uh, um, I think we might, uh, because yesterday when I uh, assisted the Essential JS workshop, I feel it's pretty interesting. And I, I saw some interesting demos also from the, the workshop. So uh, I think I can uh, put an Essential JS example just into this, um, this example node. Uh, for people to actually modify and customize a little bit this uh, this node. So I think yesterday we have a link from uh, our Slack. So it should be workshop A1. Link is here. And on the glitch playground, we will pick a, a serious one with audio buffet. This one, your source. I can paste this uh, here in the chat. Okay. So uh, yeah, for for those who haven't attended the, this workshop uh, yesterday, it's just an RMS analyzer to like measure the, the uh, volume of actual, actual um, input from an audio worklet. So uh, you have this essential processor.js, which imports a WASM uh, version of Essentia, and it will do the, the analysis here called Essentia IMS with this uh, audio input. Um, we will, I think we will need, we will not need to modify any of them. We just uh, paste, copy and paste this file, essential processor.js. I'll create a new file in source, essential uh, processor. Yes. Paste here. So uh, 
So this input from the audio booklet node may not uh, enable the audio booklet in, in the Firefox, but it should work in, in Chrome. And then we can have a look into this main JS, how it handles, uh, how it uh, shows the, the IMS, IMS value. So when I click on the start, it will just uh, have this small um, span or div that shows the, the actual value. So actually it needs an analyzer uh, with, 256 points and it will extract the, the I think the first value of the first uh, channel, which is the, uh, the value of IMS. So uh, in the draw loop, it gets from the analyzer, the, the time domain data and gets the first value here, analyzer data array zero. So this is the, the first value. I will just uh, paste, yeah, I will just, uh, I think maybe from this part, it will add this module from the script and create a new audio work that I will copy these three lines from line 24 to 29 to our Node.js, so it's, it should be in the create nodes part. Uh, and as I mentioned before, this URL should be relative to our um, index.js. So we'll just do module dot base URL plus um, Essential processor.js. So this is our URL for the audio webpet module. Then uh, in this case, our audio context is this dot context. And here also, and we will store this audio booklet node as this essential node. Maybe. So we create this uh, essential node, uh, which is an audio effect node. We don't need to modify any of them inside. And we will need an, a, another analyzer to retrieve um, the actual RMS value. So uh, here from I see uh, 78 to line 81. Here we create the uh, analyzer with some configs and this, uh, this array that we need to uh, retrieve data from the analyzer. So I copy these three lines here. I will, I will assign this analyzer uh, into this field and audio context here is this dot this dot context then the array I also store uh, here so now everything should work and then um, I will need to connect them. So it should be connected after gain node. So this dot gain node dot connect. This dot essential node. Then connect essential node to the analyzer. So uh, <clears throat> here the, uh, the node parts should be good. Then we need to show the, the value in the GUI 
So I'll open the GUI. Uh, yeah, maybe not like that. We will add a new um, element into the display. So uh, after the second input, we'll put uh, a span with an ID uh, RMS with the default value here. I need to get uh, the span using this dot root dot get element by ID RMS. Then uh, each animation frame, we can get the value from the uh, analyzer node. So uh, I can quickly switch to the example, see how they did that. So uh, uh, it's in line 89, we have uh, get flow time domain data, and the re result is just uh, analyzer data array and the zero index. So I will copy this 89, line, line 89 here, paste into handle animation frame. Uh, here, the analyzer node is under audio node, so uh, I will just get it from audio node. And the data array too, this dot audio node dot analyzer data array. And we will put the value. So the value is this first index of the array, okay? And we will uh, display this value in the span. So this dot IMS span uh, in our HTML is RMS with, uh, we'll put like six uh, values, six numbers after the, the dot, so like this, yeah. So now we should uh, be able to display the RMS value in our host, so uh, let's take a look. Yeah, it's already there. Yeah. Um, yeah, you want to say something, Michel? Really nice. Yes. Uh, yes, it's me playing the guitar each time you press the play button, so I should get some rights. Uh some uh, revenue from that. <laughs> no, sorry, just joking. Yeah, you can put the license here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a question, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the source, source code of the... Da, da, Danny, maybe you, you wanted to ask something? Well, well, I was wondering, seeing the demo, how to make uh, like uh, Essentia, I guess, is a really big package. So it would be nice to be shared between all, all the plugins that use it. And I was just thinking about it. But I guess if you if we use dynamic reports as, as it, we, we can achieve that. I don't know. Well, that's a, I know it's a technical detail. Um, um, I like it a lot. Um, the presentation. Well, it is much simpler than uh, because when you discover this for the first time, it seems like a bunch of code. But if you look carefully to the most simple examples, uh, you will you can just start uh, developing by just copying and pasting and tweaking, really. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, uh, we have. Five minutes for for the first uh, section, I think. 
maybe I can uh, quickly show another another uh, template called MIDI PMGS. So um, I will not copy paste this for just for showing that. Uh, so the rest of part is quite the same. The index JS is um, untouched, so it's really the same. Uh, one thing is a little bit different is that we have um, a MIDI processor.worklet.js. So here, actually, um, as I mentioned uh, in, the, in the slide, slide, um, let me find. Yeah, so uh, in the param manager node, it actually has um, also its current corresponded param manager processor, which handles all the uh, the web processor API. So you don't need to worry about the uh, things happened in in the processor uh, side. But we can also use this uh, web manager processor to handle some of these um, events. So here in the in the MIDI PMGS, we just want to. Um, so the example is just to transform, uh, no, to to how to say um, transpose um, the the MIDI notes coming. So here the the setting one is an uh, audio param just for um, the the note. It should transpose the steps. So it's from uh, minus 128 to 128. And what it gets is uh, in the constructor, it will get the uh, web processor created by the brand manager. So this proxy ID actually allows you to get the proxy. Uh, the, so the proxy is the, the brand manager processor corresponded. And um, you have this setting one field um, initialized here. When it's do any process, it will um, store the param parameters value um, in this setting one. Then you can attach uh, an event handler to the proxy to the to the uh, when uh, to the prime manager processor to say that when you receive any events, any web event, you will do the flow following. So the following is if the type is when MIDI, so if it's a MIDI message, and if uh, it's a note on or note, note off event, I will just uh, shift the note to uh, like have a plus or minus to the, to the actual note and then event to the, the downstream uh, audio note. It can be a synthesizer, it can be any uh, other MIDI processors. And yeah, that's it. So uh, that's the, what our processor doing. And there's just one Are difference. You, yeah, sorry. Running inside a worklet? Yeah, audio this is worklet? an audio worklet processor. Wow, nice. And then uh, in the host, we just uh, have a simple keyboard. We have our plugin, like a MIDI processor, and we have a thing synced. And we connect them together with connect event, but not connect, not audio connection. And uh, I will just launch it for the demo. Um, uh, not here. Maybe this one. I will just pause. That's it. So, uh, yeah. This so, is you the... just showed how you can uh, intercept. Uh, any events uh, in order to implement a transposer or, or something like that? Yes, this is a pure MIDI uh, WAM, not an no. audio one, but a pure MIDI one. And I think this is the end of the first section. 
seven. Okay, can you can you show again the code uh, that connects the nodes? Uh, yeah. I know that you have a slide for that, but uh, just to clarify a few things, it's we called it connect events and not connect MIDI because we uh, we decided to make an abstraction over the different protocols that exist like uh, OSC, MT or whatever. So normally you could, uh, uh, it could be, com it, sh it should be compatible with uh, any uh, kind of protocol. Yeah, we have uh, OSC, okay, we have MT. Maybe you see, maybe after? Okay. First, uh, then this MIDI can be output then to uh, root then to the MIDI output or is just to connect uh, connect a well uh, module plugin so i mean can i yeah, exactly that yeah i think i understand what you you mean that because there is a, a special thing in in the uh, audio workload uh, thread called WAMF, and this WAMF actually maintain a event graph for you. So this graph uh, will allow you to flow any MIDI events or other events from WAM to WAM. So um, yeah, when you process any MIDI events, you will need to call this um, show mm -hmm. call this emit events. Just need just need this to like. Uh, emit your event to any downstream uh, web nodes. So that means we can use the clock from the audio work leg to generate MIDI in a curate manner? Yes, actually, yeah. Yeah, you've got to demo with the random node generator, maybe you can show, Shion. Yeah, there's a, a random node uh, example here. So you just have uh, this processor. That's which nice. generates random nodes. Uh -huh. And then you can root that nodes outside MIDI again, like out of, of the computer. Oh, you, uh, no. uh, you would like to, you, you want, yes, if, if you want to control a uh, hardware, uh, hardware synthesizer, for example. Exactly. Yeah, the web MIDI uh, API allows to do that. In the previous version of the plugin standard, we had the plugins that uh, with a drop down menu to select an output device, a hardware device. Uh, but um, I think that we, we, uh, we have everything to uh, port it to the WAM2 uh, standard, but uh, we haven't yet uh, done that. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, everything is, uh, is available in the SDK because to go outside of uh, the the web audio uh, of the plugin graph, uh, you do, you have nothing to do. So you can just write a plugin that will receive events like Xiong showed, and then use just the web media API to uh, ask for the available hardware devices, and then send the media events to them. But this won't go through the SDK in that case. Good, that's nice. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's awesome. A lot of possibilities. Yeah, like you see, the se select MIDI input device that we've got, we could have a select MIDI output device here, and we could put such a um, uh, uh, drop down menu uh, inside the plugin. But this relies for the output only and for the menu only on the web MIDI API, not on the, the one two API. If I understood your question, well, I'm not, I'm not sure it, yeah. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Shihan, maybe one other detail to point out about MIDI only plugins is that, you know, just to be aware that um, if you go back to your connections code, you do have to connect it to the audio context destination just to make sure it's pulled because you're not connecting audio, but uh, just a little detail to keep track of there. Yeah. So um, maybe we should we, we make a break or do we continue? What is the the plan? Well, in theory, we should have a break now and then continue for another yeah. hour and a half. Maybe, maybe get a coffee and, <laughs> and come exactly. back. Yeah. Uh, well, we showed a lot. Of, uh, Xiong showed a lot of code, but if you take time to download the SDK and look at the examples. Um, 
Well, the SDK is uh, very rich and contains lots of things. Uh, and we haven't documented everything, but the param manager that Xiong talked about is documented. I don't think that we documented the MIDI part so much, but it will arrive. But we've got the examples. If you want just to connect a MIDI controller, a software MIDI controller to uh, a MIDI instrument, this is quite easy. Uh, Xiong showed the advanced usage with a proxy that intercepts the MIDI events. And we just uh, talked at the end about, uh, you know, having drop down menu to select input or output devices. But this is uh, just you, uh, f f uh, provided by the web MIDI API, I think. So we haven't added anything for that. But we could provide a, a plugin that is an output selector for example, media output selector or whatever. Uh, but wh what I would like to say is that uh, there is a lot of work behind what you you saw. And uh, uh, Owen, uh, that is, uh, Owen, maybe you should have told your, your background, you are uh, an old time native developer before going to web audio. Um, yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, I had kind of got a, gotten started on this stuff, making VSTs. And um, I worked for a long time at Amp Studio, and that's kind of how I got into the web audio stuff. Um, currently, I'm a DSP engineer at Creative Labs. And um, yeah, I'm still just working on this stuff. Yeah. So before Owen came to the group, we were just kids playing with toys. <laughs> and wow. then... Uh, he start, Owen started to talk about automation, about uh, trying to uh, to be uh, to stay inside the audio thread and to talk about very high performance concerns. And uh, I think that uh, without people coming from the industry and uh, with lots of experience, with uh, well, I'd say professional uh, development, uh, we wouldn't uh, have been there today. And. Uh, so what is really interesting is that we have different backgrounds in this group. So we've got Steven, who is uh, also uh, from C Sound, uh, that is an all-time uh, well-known environment. So the fact that we mixed many different people, and Xiong has also a strong background with Faust, and we uh, we also uh, been working uh, with people from the the Faust language. So when you mix all these uh, people together. Uh, well, in the end, it's interesting because uh, well, I think that we, we packed a lot of things in the SDK, even if it's not 100% complete, so a few things are missing, but uh, well, it's a, a huge, huge project. And uh, I think we should also thank Yari, Quimola, and Oliver Larkin as well. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. original uh, inception of this whole yeah. thing. And, of course. Uh, I think a lot of what I was bringing to the table was also founded in, in some of those um, concerns, trying to make sure that you can port an existing BST to the standard. Uh, yeah. So we can thank them as well. OK, so see you in 10 minutes. I'm going to get a coffee. Okay, so. Um, I'll get started here, share my screen again. So. Okay, so what I'm going to show is, um, a, as Michelle said, more of a, a low level example, uh, all JavaScript, just one audio worklet. Um, it does make use of some classes in the SDK, which I'll uh, kind of give a tour of. Um, if you want to get started, just to see, um, you know, similar to what Shihan was showing, um, the WAM example template is uh, kind of the stripped down version of what I'll be showing. So. Just to load that up here. Um, just a simple GUI. This is just a gain knob. So 
that's a game now. And uh, got a little synth part of it that's just a little noise test here. So um, just to give a quick tour of this, um, let's see. So <clears throat> here's the template. So what I've provided here, um, just a few files that are built on top of the WAM node and WAM processor classes in the SDK. So these are, again, pure JavaScript reference implementations. Um, I'll get into more detail on that, but basically, um, <clears throat> what we have here, the, the node is very simple. It's relying on the WAM node class quite a bit. Um, just a couple changes to work with the GUI. Yeah, earlier examples were extending composites node. This one is extending WAM node. Right. So it doesn't reuse any, any code, it just implements the API. Right, so there's no uh, there's no web audio nodes involved here. It's just a single audio workload node processor pair. So uh, in this example, uh, there's a there's a synth and an effect, um, kind of grouping all the parameters here. Um, <clears throat> it handles just node on node off. And just a very simple processor that can bypass and then process the synth and the effect. So if we look at the effect, it's just got this gain parameter. Um, and you know, it's just changing the gain. So you know, if we want to do something weird, we can. Just uh, mess with the sound, see what happens. <clears throat> Not much. Oh, I was hoping that would do something more fun. Um, anyway, this is where you do your uh, your effect processing code. You can see it's just a for sample loop. Your um, just input to output. And uh, one thing to note here is uh, the gain parameter is accessible via this parameter interpolator. So this kind of fills the role of, like if you're familiar with doing something like this in an audio workload, you might, um, you might uh, establish some, some parameters like uh, audio params and then access them uh, from the array that Web Audio provides you in a similar manner here. So it's basically, um, this parameter interpolator provides a similar uh, kind of interface. There's a there's an array of per sample parameter values that are kind of aligned with the processing loop. So that's like a, a big part of what the WAM node and WAM processor classes in the SDK provide is both um, sample accurate <clears throat> event scheduling and parameter interpolation without relying on the web audio API at all. Um, the synth classes, let's see. Uh, 
there's some kind of convenience stuff here. Um, synth part, synth voice. This is just set up for simple kind of stereo processing. One voice for the left channel, one voice for the right channel. Um, handles node on and node off. And the synth handles voice allocation and uh, yeah, so if you wanted to get in here and start making a synth, you would go to the synth part and that's where the actual DSP is happening. So this is our noise source right here. So that's kind of the, the simple uh, boilerplate stuff. Um, now I'll go back to the slides and yeah, so as I said, uh, there's sample accurate scheduling and uh, for sample interpolation implemented in these classes all in JavaScript. Um, I've also provided examples of uh, cross-thread communication without the message port using a shared array buffer based ring buffer, which uh, we've, uh, we're using uh, Paul Adenov's uh, ring buff class. So you'll find that in the SDK as well. Um, so of course, uh, if you're, so this example is more kind of um, oriented toward people who are more used to maybe a VST style uh, plugin development experience. Um, and if that's your background, you might be wondering like, why would I wanna do this in JavaScript? It's not the most performant language. Um, I was actually pretty surprised at how much I was able to do just in JavaScript, but, uh, and it's also, you know, obviously a very rapid, uh, iteration test cycle uh, makes it easy to, to develop that way. But um, I was hoping that if you're maybe not so familiar with uh, low level C++ audio development, that this might be a more um, accessible introduction if you're someone who's more used to writing a JavaScript. So um, I also uh, will be porting these to C++ and WASM to have examples in the SDK that are kind of equivalent just to show uh, one way to do that. So um, yes, I'm going to skip this. So I'll be showing a number of files. Again, there's kind of a lot. So I'll, I'll try not to get too lost in the details, but um, there's a number of classes in the SDK that are being used. Um, and again, the template was sort of derived from this other WAM example, just stripping out most of the kind of more specific DSP and GUI stuff. So um, if you're looking through the repo, these are the places I'll be referencing. Um, Okay, so uh, just to talk about how I've implemented sample accurate event scheduling. Um, the goal is to be able to run your, your DSP loop uh, interrupted as much as uninterrupted as much as possible. So, um, you know, even though it's not necessarily implemented as like a fully vectorized, like a SIMD or something, it's still best to be able to run your loop without having to check every sample. Do I need to update? Do I need to um, you know, start a MIDI event or something? So the... Uh... <laughs> we, saw, we saw your cat's tail. <laughs> yes, yeah. He'll be, he'll be uh, helping with the presentation as well. So, um, so basically when... when uh, the, the plugin receives events via schedule events, whether it's from the main thread or the audio thread, those will be enqueued in the uh, 
the processor. And in each uh, render quantum, it'll check to see which events are there and whether or not any of them are uh, set to happen in the current render quantum. So once those have been identified, um, the, the timestamp is converted to the corresponding sample in the, uh, you know, from zero to 127, uh, we're processing that many samples right now, which, which one is that event, uh, where does it start? So to, uh, to make sure that we're not interrupting processing too much, we cut the render quantum into um, uninterrupted sections. So you do some processing, pause and handle the event and continue. Um, so just to kind of visualize that, uh, if we have some events in the queue um, and you know their time corresponds to sample within this quantum, uh, there is this underscore process method in WAM processor, which uh, as a developer, if you're using this, you would uh, redefine that to do your custom processing and it'll be called automatically by a WAM processor uh, so that you don't really have to worry about any of this stuff. You just focus on your DSP and uh, as long as you write it in a way that is um, compatible with this where you can take you know, a start sample and an end sample and just do that processing then you're good to go. So, um, uh, Next thing would be, uh, well, maybe I'll, well, I'll just, okay. So uh, with parameter interpolation, um, if you know, you're know you familiar with this sort of thing, it, you know that you need to, to interpolate like a lot of parameters because you'll get cracker, uh, crackles or other weird artifacts if you're uh, just having them jump uh, from value to value. So um, if you're a, a web audio developer, you might be familiar, like I said, with um, accessing those pre-computed for sample values. Um, WAM processor will generate interpolators for each registered parameter and uh, handle updating those when there's a, a parameter change. And then when you access those parameters in the DSP code, um, they're, they're also already pre-computed. So you know that you're getting the right value with the right sample. So um, that's actually it for my slides. So I will go over to the code. Um, so uh, uh, when we are talking about plugins that can have hundreds of parameters interpolated, not plugins with uh, free and free parameters. This is a, uh, our, our discussion a few months ago was how are we going to handle plugins with few hundred parameters that should be automated and so on. So this is uh, uh, why I talk about uh, high performance targeting uh, at the beginning of the, of the talk. Right, right. So, of course, this is all in JavaScript, but if this uh, was happening in a WASM module instead, um, you would end up doing something similar in C++. And uh, again, it's, um, you wouldn't want to have to say, like, copy those arrays into your WASM if you were relying on web audio, audio params. Um, you would want to be doing all this interpolation directly in your C++ code. So um, again, this is kind of a model implementation. It's uh, mostly meant to be for teaching or explanatory purposes, but um, it's basically implemented all the things that you would need to do to, to handle that sort of low level stuff. Uh, there, if you look in detail at the parameter interpolator, there's some optimization it tries to do um, if you have, say, a nonlinear scaling on your parameter and it needs to render a exponential curve, you can do that. 
And in order to avoid recomputing those exponentials over and over, it, it actually caches uh, the sort of basic automation curve. So if you have lots of parameters and they interpolate over the same amount of time with the same uh, nonlinear setting, it'll actually share that. And it kind of reduces all that computation to the bare minimum uh, sort of uh, linear scaling of that curve. So uh, if you're interested in that, you can check out the uh, LAM parameter interpolator. So this is integrated tightly with the LAM parameter uh, info class, which kind of defines these various properties of the parameter. And, uh, yeah, so let's, let's take a look um, maybe first. Uh, Let's we'll start with the processor. Now here, um, there's a flag called use SAB, which if it's true, you'll it'll uh, automatically choose and, and initialize uh, these shared array buffer based methods for um, scheduling events. And I'll show later a, an example where sort of similar to what Shihang showed with the, the RMS value coming out of the plugin to the GUI, you can also uh, you know, send um, signal data from the process, the audio thread to the main thread. Uh, so to see what this looks like, there's uh, a lot of setup that still relies on, on the message port. Um, but if your processor is configured to use a shared array buffer, you'll send this uh, post message some information to establish the ring buffer on the main thread. When that arrives, the main thread will actually uh, create the array buffers and the ring buffers, send the shared array buffers back to the audio thread. And when this is all complete, um, it'll switch over processing so that um, when you do schedule events, they'll be written to the ring buffer instead of uh, going over the message port. So, that's kind of uh, kind of a lot there, but you don't have to worry about it if you just want to use it subclassing this. Um, now, getting back to the processor, if we look at how parameter values are updated, um, if you if it's coming via an event, it goes into the queue. And this queue is emptied when we create the processing slices. So basically, we're uh, we're going to loop over all the events that we have, figure out uh, how far in the future they're supposed to occur. Uh, resolve that to a sample index. And if that's actually within um, you know, 127, since we're working with a, a fixed buffer size here, it'll, uh, it'll dequeue that event, um, notify the main thread either by post message or with another ring buffer that writes back to the main thread that, okay, now we're updating this event so that you can you know, react in the GUI because some hosts might schedule events far in the future. You wouldn't want to um, sort of uh, process them all immediately, right? So um, this builds these uh, event or the uh, processing slice objects by grouping events that occur at the same sample and then cutting the buffer into these uh, continuous regions 
in between the events. So uh, if we get these processing slices and um, if we look at the process function, so we've gotten them now and it's just gonna loop over each processing slice. You get the range of samples and the events associated with it. Um, process all those events, interpolate parameter values in case some of these maybe were automation or setting new values. And then we call this uh, underscore process where you know here it's doing nothing. Uh, so it's really meant to be subclassed. But um, if we look at interpolate parameter values, this will um, actually process the interpolation for all the registered um, parameters. So uh, what it looks like when we actually set the parameter value, um, we get the standard uh, parameter data object from the API here. There's a, a string ID associated with the parameter, the value, and whether or not it's normalized. So we look up our parameter, um, set the value there just to make sure it's updated for in case it's queried later. And then the interpolator uh, will um, handle updating it. So if you're not supposed to interpolate, it just fills that buffer with a new value. So you would use that, uh, you know, maybe if you're setting a saved state plugin, you don't necessarily want it to interpolate, but otherwise um, you would want it to uh, kind of from, from the current value uh, to this new value, you're gonna make some kind of a curve to um, make sure that it's smooth and it, it sounds you know, as you expect. Uh, so <clears throat> that kind of covers uh, a lot of what I wanted to show in this class. Um, So now I'll, I'll switch over to an example where uh, I've actually implemented some more interesting stuff. So um, in the WAM example project, uh, this is where I've, I've set up uh, another ring buffer to handle uh, so this sort of like the template, there's a synth and an effect in the same plugin. And I'm gonna be uh, reporting the output levels of each of those individually to the GUI so that we can do some fun visualizations. So um, when the levels are requested, uh, we either, if we're using the shared array buffer approach, we would uh, read from the ring buffer at that point to get the latest value. Otherwise, uh, it would be set here from the message port. So the current levels are here and those will be uh, read in the GUI. And that drives a lot of uh, kind of dynamic animation and stuff that you'll see in a second here. Um, in the processor, it's a similar setup, but I'm actually creating the DSP classes here, a synth and an effect. Um, some things to handle the, uh, the levels. There's a similar pattern here where um, I'm gonna make sure to call the the WAM processors configure SAV so that we still get the array buffer or the ring buffer for events. And then we're also going to configure another one for these levels. Um, so, what I've implemented between WAM node and WAM processor uh, is a bit of it's like a promise based um, message manager. So, if something comes in on the main thread, um, it'll send the message over, uh, the audio thread will handle it, send a response back, and then the main thread promise will resolve and, you know, uh, 
um, anything that you need to do to react to that will happen. Uh, so that's that's also going on in, in the SDK classes. Um, so here we're handling the, uh, so again, we're redefining the process methods. So this is where we're gonna do our DSP. Um, we're gonna check the bypass state via the interpolator. Um, the, uh, now again, we don't have to worry about um, figuring out exactly when bypass might have changed because it's already been handled. We're, the start sample isn't necessarily zero. It's, it's the sample where, uh, if it's not zero, it means some event came in and we're handling something. So bypass might've changed, another parameter might've changed. But as long as we index the, uh, the start and end sample of this slice, we don't have to worry about it. Everything is gonna be good. So, um, First, the synth is processed, uh, adding the, its output to the, um, to the input buffers. And then the, uh, if we're checking levels, there's sort of a counter so that we're not checking the levels every single time. It's, it's kind of uh, set to around, is that defined? Uh, yeah, so like around 30 frames per second. Um, right, so uh, there's a lot of code in here to update the levels. Um, so the synth is processed and then the effect is processed here and we compute the effect levels. And if it's a frame where we're going to send those updated levels to the main thread, then we either write to the ring buffer or post message, depending on which mode it's configured in. So now if we look at the effect, um, this effect implements this sort of drive with a guitar pedal. Um, so I was having fun with these examples. If you are curious to check out this uh, sort of a cheap sign approximation, um, it's used <clears> for <throat> the synth oscillator, but also to uh, for this drive effect. Um, so we have uh, here. There's an example. I'm I'm sort of uh, mapping that drive parameter to to internal um, sort of, they're not like exposed parameters, but they sort of act as parameters in the DSP. So there's a the dirty and the clean are kind of a, uh, <coughs> not exact like a, like a mix, but it's sort of like, as you change the drive, you get more dirty and less clean. And there's a bit of uh, feedback involved and um, basically we come in here, if, if the drive parameter is changing, then that means we need to update those um, sort of derived parameters. So that's what happens here. If the drive is fixed, uh, which is something that's reported by the interpolator, then it means we don't have to worry about recomputing those. They're, they're the same from the last frame. So we don't have to, expend uh, CPU on that. Now, getting into the processing loop, this is where the actual drive effect is implemented. Um, the, uh, we loop over the channels, we loop over the samples from start to end, and that fills the buffer. Um, this is this, effect class is sort of a wrapper around this. So there's some other things going on. There's some simple filters that help condition the signal before and after the drive is applied. Um, those can be found in the LAN example components. They're just 
really the simplest uh, little IIR filters here. Uh, nothing fancy. Um, but they're used in, in both the effect and the synth. So we look here, what we're gonna do is uh, low pass the signal to help uh, suppress aliasing after the drive is applied and then make sure there's no DC. Um, some of this you could probably get away with you know, not doing, but um, I was sort of curious just to see how much processing I could do without breakups. So, um, right, so that's, that's kind of the tour of the effect. Uh, the synth, um, again, it's, it's very similar to what I showed with the, uh, the template, only now we have some specific uh, DSP in there. So we have a, an envelope, which is both an envelope and a sort of wave shaper, which uh, lends some harmonics as the, uh, during the attack and, and release. Um, this is just a sort of another kind of component that'll be used to build this, the synth voice. Um, there's an oscillator, again, based on that sign approximation, but we have a few different modes where um, you can get some different waveforms by um, kind of uh, modifying it. So one of them is sort of like a, a rectified sign. Um, there's uh, <clears throat> some interesting things you can do combining two of those oscillators. So when you actually get to the part, there's two oscillators and depending on the mode, you'll, um, you'll get uh, different combinations of those. Um, And that's what uh, we'll find in processing code here. So when they're when the oscillators are combined, it's actually subtracting the output of one from the other. Uh, there's some uh, some more filtering going on uh, before and after the envelope is applied, and then we basically just uh, add the synth output to this buffer, which will be. Um, the final output of the synth. Um, synth voice is uh, handling kind of the higher level stuff, node on, node off. It has, uh, uh, based on the note and the velocity, it's going to configure um, the filter settings and the envelope settings for the part left and right. And the um, processing is very simple. It just uh, delegates that to the parts, fills the buffer. And finally, the synth is what is going to expose these parameters to change the voice modes. And um, you'll notice that in the effect and the synth, I'm passing in parameter interpolators from the processor. So that's how we uh, are able to access those interpolated parameter values in the DSP without having to uh, duplicate it or copy it. It's, it's handled by the plan processor in the SDK and we just uh, get that behavior for free here. So we'll make some references to those so you can access them. Um, voice allocation is happening here. Uh, just a kind of simple voice stealing if you do run out of voices. Um, yeah, and the processing is basically just to loop over all the voices and if they're active, um, add their output to the buffer and, and that's it. So that was kind of a lot, <laughs> I know. Um, but now we can actually see uh, what it does. And then maybe I'll go into a bit 
of the P. So here is the effect. Um, if we listen to it, uh, I've got a little test MIDI here. Play some notes. If we go from clean to crunchy. We can change the voice modes here. I've been uh, retuning it a bit because some of the output was very loud <laughs> and I didn't want to blow up everyone's ears. So it was a little bit more gnarly uh, a day or two ago, but um, for everyone else's sake, I've tamed, tamed the cat a little bit here. Um, Again, uh, so the the GUI is all updated. The uh, um, event listeners on the audio node. So um, I'm not sure if Xiang touched on this, but the audio node is actually uh, and able. You can add and remove event listeners to it, and um, so in uh, in this case. We look at. If it's, yeah, I think it's in WAM node. When an event has been processed, and uh, again, that's indicated by the processor sending a, a response to a previously scheduled event. Um, that'll be received here, and we just dispatch that same WAM event so that uh, the listener, in this case, the GUI, can update its state based on that. So that's how we can achieve something like this, where if we automate the drive parameter, I can see it here, but it'll, uh, it'll update in real time as those events get processed. So um, yeah, I guess that's uh, out it there. If we look at the GUI code, going back to the template, uh, that'll be the simplest version of this. I, when I started developing this, I had based it on um, I think it was another example, the, the quadrifuzz uh, without builder somewhere in here. And um, so there's still a lot of uh, things that are kind of vestigial. And um, I've been trying to make sure to clean it up. There was one thing I saw in Xiang's code, which I think I'm missing, which is to uh, actually deregister the animation frame callback uh, when the GUI is destroyed. I think I have that, so I should add that. Um, anyway, so here's here's the basic template for the example. Um, I've got this parameter, uh, which is I found was kind of handy when you're uh, developing the UI to be able to change the scale of it, so you can see the details without having to zoom in on your browser. So the CSS is actually a dynamically generated string um, based on that and some constants. Oh, I guess the other one, there's some constants that go in here. Uh, there's a very simple HTML template I'm using the uh, um, web audio controls library, which a lot of the other examples use. So this kind of uh, gives you knobs and switches and sliders for free and um, you know attach event listeners to those there's a MIDI learn function so there's some useful stuff in there that um, these are taking advantage of just to make it easier to get a GUI up and running easy, uh, quickly um, so we uh, get a handle to the plugin when this is created. And from there, um, 
we can access properties of parameters or um, you know attach these listeners. So here is where uh, we actually make the GUI listen to these automation events so that um, the controls can be updated based on uh, the most recent state. And, uh, yeah, we just update the GUI and there's not much else here, just uh, registering event listeners on the, the widgets so that it'll actually call a set parameter on the plugin. Um, if we look at the more complex example, um, there's more CSS, uh, slightly more complicated template, but still not much. And um, most of what's happening is uh, drawing this SVG um, as the uh, playback is updating the, the levels. So um, there's some setup here, but then basically once that's ready, it's got a little bit of uh, a way to manage how often it's redrawn. So we're not burning out the processor, just drawing the GUI. And the levels come in, as I said, uh, when the animation frame is redrawing, we request the latest levels from the plugin. And that's used uh, in a whole lot of <laughs> funky ways to, to draw all these things that are uh, animated. So um, I guess that's that's kind of the, the tour. And I know it's a lot to take in, but um, I guess uh, does anyone have any questions or things they want to clarify about anything I talked about? Okay. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> oh, and I'd, I'd like to ask about the uh, uh, a couple of things about the signal processing architecture. So the, um, uh, the parameter interpolation uh, is to me it basically looks like just a unit generator that's um, upsampling input to to audio rate. Is is that how you see it? Uh, that's I guess not normally how I think about it, but yeah, that that seems accurate. Yeah, it's uh, we're getting these discrete parameter updates that um, you know the host when it's drawing an automation curve, it's actually sending multiple periodic parameter updates. So it's it's taking those which are at some arbitrary rate and kind of filling in the gaps uh, so that it is audio rate internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and I, I guess this is sort of contrary to web web audio, but I, I wonder if uh, if if you guys had discussed having uh, multiple sample rates. So if you had a like honest frame rate or um, what do you call it? Uh, well, yeah, block rate or frame rate signals uh, that were like one twenty eighth of the the audio rate. Then you know there might be uh, some some different ways you could structure things. Um. So you mean like uh, in terms of maybe modulation or something or or. Yeah. Uh, so, so like, I, I mean, I've implemented uh, 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 systems where uh, inputs uh, could either be uh, sample rate or or mm. block rate, and then if if you do that, like in, instead of upsampling the low sample rate stuff, you can um, in the inner loops you can convert that to uh, increment if you want to you know if you're doing linear interpolation to upsample um, that becomes like a register to register add so you uh, at least I believe that's a lot faster than uh, you know fetching samples from from memory or, or cache 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the the main re my main motivation for doing it the way I did was that we do support uh, nonlinear interpolation, and so um, especially if there's a lot of that going on. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it still kind of reduces that aspect to um, like a, a multiply and an add. Uh, but, you know, again, um, I do want to uh, just clarify that, like, I don't, I don't think that everyone's going to want to use everything in the SDK, um, and especially stuff like this that's been implemented purely in JavaScript is, is not going to be like the most bare metal uh, performant implementation. But just to um, provide some stuff so that people who, you know, don't already necessarily know how to do it or aren't even necessarily aware that, you know, dezippering is a thing, uh, won't be surprised if um, they're trying to make a plugin and, um, you know, the stuff isn't there. So it, it's really just, uh, it's one way to, to make the sausage. So um, yeah, of course you can, yeah. you can imagine all kinds of ways of implementing this DSP and, and um, the API itself, the LAM2 API is totally agnostic about how you do that. So um, if you wanna, you know, write something in, in C or C++ and compile it to Wasm, put it in your audio worklet, uh, you can. So, hey guys, um, we have 15 minutes left. So we... Oh, geez. Okay. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, so, I better. Um, can, you hear, can you hear me? Pass the mic. Yes, Michelle. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. My, my headset uh, ran out of battery. So, I. Okay. Maybe we should uh, go on. Uh, there is only a few time left for me and Tom. So yeah, I think that you can uh, uh, contact Owen or talk with Owen uh, later on. So I think I am going to present now because I lost my headset for a minute. I'm sorry. I didn't know what happened. Yeah. Uh, can Go you stop? It. Okay. I can. I will. Sh I'm sharing my screen. So I will do uh, this part of the presentation quickly. Uh, I think we are. Yeah, we are here. Uh, so I'm going to show more demonstrative stuff and less technical, but I will show how you can make plugins one, two in a minute uh, using the first programming language that will uh, compile into WebAssembly. And um, with a GUI, GUI builder, you will be able to produce one, two in a, very quickly and then fine tune by hand the GUI, for example. So first is a DSL for DSP programming uh, that is born in 2002 and has been developed by people from Gram in France. And uh, it's already used by uh, audio developers uh, for commercial native plugins as it can compile to many different targets like uh, C, C++, VST, Juice, and so on. And uh, in 2018, uh, uh, Stefan Letts and uh, Jan Orlare uh, added the WebAssembly uh, support and uh, started to work with us uh, for producing uh, the uh, web audio plugins. So um, the main tool I'm going to show is the first IDE that is uh, online. And uh, that is uh, an environment where you can compile code directly into the browser. And uh, it comes with, uh, well, more than 100 examples. But on GitHub, you can find also many different projects that implements uh, very uh, common effects uh, or instruments. So uh, you start from uh, a piece of code, and then you click the run button. And uh, you can build the GUI and export it and uh, use it in, in uh, any host. So I'm going to show you um, some uh, some example of the first ID. So uh, I'm going to uh, first dot first ID dot gram dot fr. Uh, you need to check here that the GUI builder for web audio plugins is enabled. And then you can uh, go to the example menu where it comes with lots and lots of different effects, Flanger for browser, uh, you know, uh, 
let's see a free verb for browser, for example, I take this one. So uh, the code is here, so you can start learning first or just reuse code or copy and paste from examples, but it's a language that compiles to directly to a sort of diagram. It's a functional language that is uh, useful for describing electronic circuitry. So here I just compile the code. So the compiler is in WebAssembly in the browser. I click uh, the, the, the small row, this compile the code, and I've got the effect here. I can try it if I plug a guitar, for example, I can select my audio uh, sound card, or I can use a, I can use a, a okay, some sample, or I can drag and drop any uh, audio file here. So the, the tool comes with lots of uh, uh, visualizer for frequencies, for oscilloscope and so on. But where is it interesting? It's here, it's the UI builder uh, part. So all, all what you see on the left are examples that I tried. So let's say an, an implementation of the Roland TS9 distortion pedal, for example. If I click here, I've got this example that is runnable, or uh, let's say flanger, a flanger here uh, that is also uh, runnable uh, directly, or the big muff uh, from electroharmonics. This is a recreation of this famous fuzz effect. So if I click on the GUI builder, from there, I can make my own uh, GUI. So for example, let's uh, say, okay, this is, will be my main title. So we've got uh, uh, a GUI builder, classical one that you can use, uh, you know, specify the color, the fonts, the, uh, well, a lot of things. Uh, why isn't it working? Oh, it's a border. Okay, the color is here. So you can change the color, the border, the type of knobs that you're going to use. Sorry, yes, okay, this one drive you can change i'm going fast because we are running out of time but just uh, take your time uh, michelle we have uh, 40 minutes i think yeah ah okay uh, 40 minutes i saw it was uh indeed uh, it ends at six so okay so yes thank you <laughs> i thought we had only a quarter, okay, 15 minutes so uh so for thank example you. i'm okay i'm just uh playing with that very quickly. So um, you can add, uh, if you click on the pedal, a texture to it. You can uh, create gradients. So I'm really improvising uh, everything. <laughs> so you can create a gradient, select the transparencies so that you can see through it. And um, you can, I can change the, well, all the labels, for example, if I want the same uh, tone, I can select all here select all the labels okay we've got a small bug because sometimes we must adjust the width of the labels but uh well you see the id and um, when you are happy with uh, your wonderful uh, looking plugin okay let's uh, try to make something not too ugly like that yeah uh, okay when you're happy with it you um, can try it by um, publish it. So when I click this button, this will publish a wall folder with all the generated files, including the WebAssembly, DSP parts, and the GUI and so on as a web component. So it's saved on a remote server. And then you've got an iframe here and you can try it. So for example, I click here. It's fully functional. You can download it as a zip file. I click here, so I've got a zip file here. And if I unzip it, uh, I don't know where it is. Okay. If I unzip it, I've got uh, the, the generated uh, um, plugin. I've got the original first code here if I want to regenerate it. I've got the WASM module here. I've got a small host with the index.html file. And I've got the, the common GUI file that uh, we've shown with uh, other examples. And uh, you can use it. It's uh, also uh, MIDI uh, learn ready. So you can uh, control the knobs using any MIDI controller. And um, uh, if you go to the, the external tab here, you can see it on a web page published on a remote server. And this is the URI of the plugin. So that means that if you copy and paste that uh, in the SDK, for example, that we uh, used many times 
since the beginning. If I copy and paste the URI here, but instead of HTML, that is the host, I use GS at the end. I can load the plugin and I can try it in this host. And if it's published and uh, I want to reuse it in any host, I can. And Tom, that will present just uh, right after me, uh, has written a host and uh, in his own host, he loaded uh, some plugins that I created yesterday. So uh, uh, furthermore, what we have, uh, but uh, I didn't have time to uh, package everything, is that uh, we have also, uh, uh, I started to set up uh, uh, a plugin repo, uh, not repository, sorry, not the reposition. Okay. So all the plugins that have been generated are exposed here. And if you would select uh, one of the, um, one of the, uh, the URI, you've got the plugins running uh, here in, in the web page, so you can reuse them in any host. So for example, this one called Free Verb Toto that I created yesterday. So the, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, coming back, I think. Yeah, if I paste it here and add index.js at the end, this is the URI. So it puts here and uh, I can try it. It's a reverb. So uh, once this has been created, uh, you can just open a, a source code editor and uh, personalize the GUI. So uh, all the examples here in the first section, why I, I, I wrote generated by first ID, they have been created exactly uh, like what I did in real time, except that maybe I, I took more than one minute to uh, generate the, <laughs> the, the GUI. So uh, here, for example, this is a very popular uh, phaser recreation of the stone phaser by electroharmonics. So, uh, okay, this is the uh, auto-generated, uh, uh, sorry, auto-generated um, GUI. So let's make it a little bit uh, nicer, maybe. So, okay, I don't know. Yeah, okay, a little bit nicer with a, a GUI like that. Okay, imagine that is this is my incredible pedal. Uh, okay, publish preview. Okay, okay, open a new tab. It's here. And I've got my father that I can also reuse in any uh, any um, host. So uh, this is uh, interesting because first is very popular and you can find hundreds of uh, examples. Uh, the last year we had a challenge, it was 21 plugins in 21 days and the GUI builder and exporter was not uh, as developed as what we've got here. But uh, I think, yes, develop, uh, yeah, it, this was presented in another uh, conference, but uh, I wrote for one of my apprentice students um, a list of DSP code, the first code I found, and I asked him, please make all these plugins. So these are some examples, but um, we developed um, uh, a host for that. If I have time, I can show that to you. Uh, why is it? Uh, why is this thing? Um, okay, I lost it. So I think it was Wasabi something. Yes, okay, this one. So this is a host that uh, we've wrote for the, the previous versions of the uh, of the plugin standards, and we are going to update it. But if you look at this, all these plugins uh, were created using this tool, this online tool. Uh, so we got uh, Wawa, Overdrive, Shimmer, uh, complex reverbs, uh, phasers, uh, different sort of distortions, uh, and so on. So uh, all all of these plugins have been created without really touching the GUI, except a few ones, like for example, this Wawa, we had to, uh, we, we tweaked by hand the animation of the pedal, of the foot pedal. And this one here, the big muff, we had to adjust the texture by hand so that it fits perfectly. And uh, when we clicked on the button so that a LED is uh, glowing and uh, turning on and off. Okay, so these were just very 
small enhancements we we did and here we added uh, i think for this one we added just the 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 border the the white borders uh, of this plugin just to make it a bit clearer because this was not provided in the gui builder so um well so that means that uh, you've got really multiple uh, ways to make uh, one two plugins. So this one is uh, for people who want to learn fast or reuse one of the many examples, tweak the GUI. Uh, Owen showed you a very low level, a very low level approach, and uh, Xiong showed you a basic JavaScript approach. So now I'm going to uh, give control to Tom, who uh, is a, a an audio developer. Uh, that uh, started to produce one, two, except if you have some questions, I can answer also. By the way, we presented this tool as at the last work uh, in uh, Trondheim, the, the, the online ID. So any questions? Everything is online, you can play with it. And uh, oh, by the way, sorry, I forgot to show you one slide. Uh, on the next slide, and, uh, did we share the, this presentation, by the way? Uh, I've wrote a tutorial, a complete tutorial on Google Docs, and I will paste the, the link to the, the slides, where you can really do step by step, make your own plugins in, uh, let's say, five minutes. Everything I, I, I did is uh, documented here, select in the, bro in the menu, an example, click, and so on. So from uh, all the steps that I did in real time during the demo are here. So you, you, uh, I just make screen made screenshot yesterday when I created this one. So um, I'm going to pass uh, the, the control to Tom and share the link uh, of this presentation to the to the to the conversation. Okay, Tom, you can go. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, yeah. As a very Canadian uh, opening, I have to apologize to Owen. Uh, Owen, I thought we were finished at the hour mark. I uh, didn't mean to cut you off, sorry. No worries. Oh, me too. I, I thought it was finished in one minute. That's what yeah, I stressed. Yeah. Me too. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so... There we go. Okay, so um, my name's Tom Burns, and today I'm going to show you a couple of things that you can do with WAMs online today, and hopefully get you excited and want to build WAMs and start using them. Um, so I'll also give you a quick overview of the 14 WAMs that I've built and have open sourced. So um, if you have an idea on something to build that is you might be able to use some of the code that I've written as an example uh, or as a uh, jumping off point. Um, so what I've been working on is a public WAM host called sequencer.party. Um, it's kind of like, if you can imagine a DAW like Ableton Live meets an online editor like Google Docs, or if you're familiar with the uh, iPad audio uh, ecosystem, it's very similar to, in concept to a, a program called OM. And it's also got that it, it also borrows some ideas from the website codepen.io. So, what do I mean by that? Um, it is a live, collaborative, multiplayer audio environment. Uh, you can work with other people where if you edit the session, they see the updates live. If they edit it, you'll see it live. As well, you can then publish your session publicly so that, similar to CodePen examples, um, you can share an example, whether it's an example of, of the WAM that you're using or an example of you know, some music that you've made. So in Sequencer Party, everything is a WAM. Um, it's, it's a multi-track environment, but the sequencer, is a plugin. So uh, I have a piano roll written that I'll show you in a moment. 
all of the audio instruments are WAM plugins. The effects are WAM plugins. And I've also extended the WAM API so that you can uh, build, uh, it's a little bit uh, high level, but um, you can build a WAM that generates modulation to control a parameter of a different WAM. So for example, you can, uh, what I've got here is a step sequencer that will over, over time uh, modulate uh, a, a parameter so you can automate it. It's, it's, it. it ends up being a workflow very similar to like a modular synthesizer. Um, all of these WAMs that I've built are open source. And so um, I'll provide the link in the chat, but um, you, can, you can download a package off of NPM and in there, the WAMs are already built. So they're ready to be served up and used on your host. Um, so I'm gonna move straight to a demo, I think, because it's the most fun. Um, so let's take, so let's start a session. Um, I'm gonna say everybody can modify state. Okay, so let's do that. So can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to take uh, Owen's WAM example synthesizer and I'm going to add it. So um, in Sequencer Party, when you start out with a blank session, you have to add a track, then you add a clip. And so now I'm going to add an instrument here on this track. Um, just last night, I added a text box so you can add WAM URLs directly. Um, I'm hosting a slightly modified version of Owen's WAM example synthesizer. Um, so here it is. And I'm going to run it through one of the WAMs that Michelle generated from the FOST IDE. So here it is. Uh, and now I'll demonstrate just the piano roll. And so if I draw in a couple notes, it should work. Oh. And one more oh. check. There we go. And if I enable it. Um, are you sharing your audio? Oh, oh, how do I share audio? Um, I think you have to, you'll probably have to restart the share. There's a little checkbox at the bottom left when you start sharing that. Oh, shoot. To... Oh, yeah, share computer sound. Okay, thank you, Owen. Sorry about that, everybody. All right. There's a small uh, drop down menu just next to the share audio, and then you get stereo as well, which is great. Okay, so um, in, in order to do that, apparently I have to restart my computer. So instead, what I'm going to do is something a little bit riskier which is that I'm actually just gonna paste this um, sequencer party link into the chat. Um, I did not realize that that was something I would have to do in this case. So that's really unfortunate, but um, here we go. Um, I just need to go to the chat here. Chat, there we go. Okay, so um, if I, share this link with other people. You should be able to click on that and now join the sequencer party session that, uh, that we are in. And if you hit play on your computer, you should be able to hear it. Oh, and I can see people turning knobs. We're now getting into uh, uncharted territory a little bit. Um, I have, I've done two people shared sessions here, but never more than that. So uh, if this doesn't work, it's because uh, I've, it still has bugs. So um, I can see parameters changing. Uh, if you hit play, you should be able to also hear it, hopefully. Uh, um, on my side, it, it works perfectly. That's amazing. That's great. Um, OK, and, so. And I must say I'm, I'm speechless with this cat's, cat, cat GUI by Owen. I yes. Love it. Yes, I love it too. It's, it's excellent. Um, <laughs> Okay, so so um, besides this, uh, these instruments, um, 
I guess I will switch back to, uh, let's see here. I'm a little bit out of order now because of the, uh, the, the audio issue I wasn't expecting, but um, what I really hoped to do was show everybody this. Um, here we go, yeah, and more notes coming in on the, on the session. This is wonderful to see. Uh, if anyone, is it working for everybody? How's it going? I, I'm getting no sound. Yeah, me neither. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 are you on Google Chrome because it uses MIDI? So you need to have uh, Chrome. Uh, this it is also, only. It'll, this one will also work with Firefox, generally speaking. Uh, um, I haven't tried it with these WAMs in particular. Um, but what I'm going to do is uh, I'm, I'm going to share a different session with people that uses WAMs that I've, like, I, I haven't tested too much with these WAMs just because they are uh, WAMs written by uh, Owen and Michelle. But um, I, here, I'll share another session with people. In, um, yeah. In Chrome, uh, I it looks like Chrome own. works and Firefox does not work. Okay, so yeah, so that... yeah. In Firefox, web media is, uh, the events cannot cannot come, so the the doesn't work. The the media stuff. Right. Okay. I have um, I have like a weird issue in Chrome, like the piano roll is infinitely growing. Oh, and... me too. Me too. Same thing. Yeah, oh no. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank Thank you for that. Um, I had that on one computer and I solved it, but uh, it it might be a problem once again, that's that's unfortunate. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna share a session one that doesn't use the uh, the piano roll. Um, so here's, here's a different link. Um, so one of the other sequencers I've built, which is also a wham, um, if you load this session and then click on the uh, track, or sorry, tr click on the clip underneath the track, it should load uh, I'm still sharing my screen, so if you can't see it, you can you can follow on my screen here. Um, so in this case, this sequencer is a sequencer where um, you write JavaScript code that emits MIDI events. And so uh, what happens here is that the code in this editor actually gets sent to the audio thread, and then it gets called in the process loop uh, once on every tick, which a, a tick in this case, I think is, uh, not, I have it set up to be 96 uh, pulses per quarter note. Um, but if you hit play, what you should hear is, uh, this is my ambient piano generator. And so it's gonna generate diatonic seventh chords, as well as uh, more rarely add a little bit of lead for, for color. Um, and so this is just sort of another example of, um, of whams, another example of a more, uh, a more abstract yeah. sequencer um, and a demo of a couple more of the, uh, the whams that I've built. And so the idea here is that um, people could be um, like we are right now uh, across the planet and be jamming. Um, so I'll, I'll set up one more session here and um, let's see. Yeah, all right. So I'll make a new session and invite you to it. And I'm gonna say everybody can do everything session and okay so here we go and then I'm gonna add some instruments um, let's see here piano roll uh, one of the other instruments I've made here is a port of mutable instruments elements Eurorack module uh, and so this one's also open source and um, the code is available uh, it uses Inscripten to compile the DSP. Um, so here it. I must say that the collaborative uh, update, the real-time update at a Google Doc, is really really cool for that for for this tool. Thank you. So I see my sc my screen move, so I like it. <laughs> All 
right, so if you hit play, you should be able to hear some some notes, and then I'll hear loud. Oh yeah, and I hear people changing it. <laughs> ah, well, let me then, add a note somewhere. <laughs> then. And I've got a second track going here with drums. <laughs> so yeah, it's Ableton meets Google Doc meets uh, Web Audio modules. Yeah. Wow. So uh, we should hear uh, sound, or do we have to click play? Uh, in this case, you... yeah, you have to hit. You'll have to click play. Okay, so so we have to. Click... <laughs> oh, it works. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Uh, thank you, everybody. That was that. This has by far been the uh, the the greatest stress test of of what has been built here and um to me this demonstrates the opportunity of uh web web audio because it's it's not just trying to take the uh the existing experience of of daws and bring it to the web but it's instead it it, it takes the 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 innate benefits of the web and brings those new benefits to the audio experience. Uh, th this is this is wonderful. Uh, originally, I got this domain because party uh, domains were on sale, but um, I think like like we're experiencing here, uh, music is something that is much more fun when you share it with other people. So uh, this is this is exactly yes, exactly wham party. Um, what I would love to see is is this happening and we're using instruments and effects and sequencer that's uh built by by everybody by the community and shared because uh all of all of the plugins the sequencers the effects everything is all wham plugins so yeah and and the fact that everything is encoded in the url make it so easy to share too exactly yep um and so like the the vision that i've i've been trying to create is exactly this and when when you and uh, other people are uh, you've created this session at the end, you can save it and share this session URL. And it's like codepen.io where somebody could come along and fork it and then make their own changes. Um, as well, um, there's a whole like potential for an ecosystem where um, if I make a preset for an instrument and save it that's instantly gonna be available to all the other users. And so you'll be able to, um, as a, it, it kind of brings together a lot of the pieces that right now, you know, you might download a VST and then um, have to go find a preset from somewhere else and all these things. And it brings it all into one session where you can just really quickly create things, share it with people and hopefully have a lot of fun while you're doing it. That's great. It worked. Oh, great. All right. So, um, that's, that's, that's everything from me, uh, unless there are questions. Uh, you, you have some extra slides, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so I, I decided to mostly, um, oh, okay. mo mostly just um, do this live. I can go over my slides real quick here. So yeah, you saw the piano roll. Um, the functional sequencer that lets you just have, if, if you want to try to algorithmically um, come up, like make music, generate music, uh, you could use this. Um, MIDI effects are also supported, uh, similar to the processor that Chi Hong demonstrated. Uh, the instruments, um, the, the Synth 101 uh, is inspired by the Roland SH-101 and it's open source. It's built with high level web audio nodes and it uses the param manager that you saw earlier um, for connecting the, the for um, 
kind of uh, wrapping all of the web audio parameters and turning them into um, a, like a, a smaller set of WAM parameters. Uh, the other instrument that I mentioned was the uh, a port of mutable instruments elements Eurorec module. So that's an example if you want to try to port existing DSP written in C++, this, this could be a potential starting point for you. Um, I have a number of audio effects. Um, these are all just simple wraps of the high-level web audio API. Um, so they're decent starting off points if that's what you want to do, but they're all put to shame by uh, the FOST demo that you've already seen. Um, one thing that we didn't try in this demo was the modulator WAMs. So uh, I can go to the session real quick here and um, under Synth 101. Oh, somebody did add an LFO, but I think the LFO is actually broken right now. But um, yeah, I couldn't us. get it working. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's my fault. Um, the LFO, um, I, I haven't, I, I, I re-implemented a couple things and the LFO hasn't been, um, hasn't been updated, but now uh, with the step sequencer here, if you look, if you hit play, you'll see and hear the uh, the step sequencer now is controlling the filter frequency, um, and so you can automate parameters that way. I intend to also like. There's nothing stopping somebody from building um, a more traditional automation curve. Um, Wham module to be able to do that that modulation. Um, so that that example is also in the GitHub repository of my WAMs. Um, and so that's that's the link there for all of the WAM code that I have uh, I've written. Um, I can paste that in the chat. Oh. Uh, the one other thing I wanted to mention, so in terms of uh, what's, what's coming soon, uh, definitely more live coding. Um, the same approach where you get to write code and then, and then save it and run it. There's no reason why you couldn't be doing this for DSP code as well. So it, what I was hoping to create here would be a really easy starting off point for um, if you had an idea and you didn't want, if, if you didn't want the, the overhead of, of writing your own WAM and publishing it, you would be able to just uh, start a session and start coding it directly in here. And when you're comfortable with it, when you've got something you like, it would be quite easy to then take this code and put it into a WAM and then publish it. Um, and then the only other uh, future that I wanted to mention is that I'm also playing with um, a slight modification to the WAM API so that in a, as opposed to just passing audio between WAMs, there's no reason why you can't also pass GL textures between WAMs, which would let you um, create a video processing chain similar to VGing software like VDMX, um, Touch Designer, things like that, where you could build um, and, and you, it, it, it really works well to still be a WAM because you could depend on the host for parameter automation, but you can also potentially generate a, or write a plugin where uh, it ingests audio and then it generates reactive visuals based on the audio as a, uh, as a starting point, similar to, you know, you know typical uh, visualizers for music and things like that. Um, all right, that is uh, all the slides. So yeah, I'm, my, I'm done my part. Uh, unless there's questions. We had the best Very team was at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm really, really glad that that didn't break in the demo. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, guys, you must know that we fixed one million things during the last two days. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay, maybe I will conclude. Uh, uh, okay, so let's go.
it was a great demo, uh, Tom. So conclusion, just one slide. So you saw uh, many examples, very different from uh, very technical low level ones by uh, Owen uh, to really great uh, entertaining demos by Tom with uh, simple tutorials by uh, Xiong and myself. Uh, uh, so, you, so you get different levels there. So, um, you can use uh, the SDK, you can go to look at Tom's uh, WAMS, and Tom's, Tom WAMS, as he followed the guidelines, could load in any host, in your own web page, and anything. So the same with the first plugins or with the perk, uh, per, the, 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 the perk plugin with the cat and so on. So what we need to do now um, is that we just have, uh, I showed uh, an example in a real commercial DAO uh, at the very beginning. So we need to test this with real host uh, vendors, with DAO vendors. So we started to talk with them uh, because they might have, well, more needs, uh, more requirements and so on. Uh, we need more example using WASM. So um, Owen said he was going to uh, to do some C++ examples. And at the very beginning of the project, we had uh, Jerry Clemola and Oliver Larkin. We were the, the pioneers there. And uh, they will certainly, uh, I hope, jump again in, uh, in the group and, uh, and do some examples. The licenses are a bit a mess because as we put many different uh, code, uh, you know, that we reuse, so we've got Paul Adnos ring buffer that is under Modia uh, license. So we've got, we choose the MIT license for our own code and uh, the web audio controls uh, for the knobs, you know, the library uh, is an Apache 2 version 2 uh, uh, license, but it will be open source for sure. Also, when you distribute a plugin, do we distribute it with your own version of the SDK or are we uh, try, will we try to uh, have a sort of reference version uh, online on a CDN or as an NPM module or whatever? So uh, all these things are still under discussion. Um, I showed very, very draft example of what the remote server API could be by sending a JSON with the description of all the, the plugins. From the URI, you can get the descriptors of each plugin that contains a thumbnail and some information. But uh, all these things is still uh, early uh, in early stages. Uh, OK, uh, with the previous version of the, of the plugin standards, we uh, developed some unit tests and so on. So there are unit tests that Owen uh, put in the SDK. But I don't think that they are documented or uh, explained. Owen, just complete or uh, <laughs> tell me if I'm wrong. No, uh, that's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah OK. So just there for my own <laughs> use as I was writing. Yeah. But it, it's true that if you are a plugin developer that will use this SDK, it would be cool if you could um, make a, a very quick test to check if you haven't forgotten anything. And, uh, well, also we've got uh, problems, not problems, but uh, namespacing issue in the audio workload global scope. So uh, I don't know, I think it's Chiong that showed some imports uh, in an audio workload that doesn't work in Firefox. And also if we are, uh, uh, well, different plugins that are loading different version of the classes from different SDKs, we don't know, uh, there is some, uh, the first one will be taken into account and not the others. Well, maybe I'm, I'm wrong here. Uh, also, Tom and Owen tell me if I'm saying bad things, uh, false things, but it's still a work on pro in progress. And um, the SDK for the moment is located on a private account. It's public, but sorry, it's not the Web Audio Modules official GitHub account. It will be there uh, in, uh, I think, one or two weeks when we, uh, we have cleaned a little bit what we've done for the work. And um, also, the documentation and uh, the demos should be available directly from the webaudiomodules.org website. So I finished. I hope you enjoyed the, the presentation. And if you got a few questions, uh, you, ask, uh, you must uh, ask them now. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. 
Uh, by the way, <laughs> I, I will have also to leave at in four minutes because I've got another visual for, for my today, every day was work. So, uh, and I will join a little bit later the, the rest of the conference. Well, I have a question, but um, I, I, I missed the first part of the parameters explanation by you, Owen, I think. Sorry. So uh, I, will, I will review when this video is published, but meanwhile, do you have some links or where, where I can, because I, I want to make some kind of automation and I would like to know how it works. Or, so sure, yeah. yeah. Um, if you can point me to some like, at least foundations or something or how to tackle that problem or at least how how you do, did it yeah so i would i would say um the best place to look in the sdk is the uh lamb processor class and this uh -huh. is again it's kind of the it's just a one implementation mm -hmm. uh, in javascript so it, it shows kind of like you know one way to deal with everything you've got to do um not to say that it's the best way but mm -hmm. it's one way. One so, way. Uh, that's you. yeah. Um, that that's where you'll find the um, sample accurate event scheduling stuff, which is kind of integrated with parameter interpolation. Mm -hmm. And cool. uh, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Okay. You know, down the road, I think my Great. Uh, email I will, is somewhere. Probably. Here, so, yeah. Thank you. Sure. And thanks for everyone uh, coming to this. Thank you. Nice workshop.